right, welcome to session nine of History 3375, the CIA in the Third World. Today we're going to be looking at the CIA intervention in Vietnam. Now, we have to distinguish this particular intervention from those that we've been looking at before and even those that will come afterwards in several different respects. First of all, in terms of the CIA's involvement in Vietnam, whereas with the other cases we've looked at, the CIA was the dominant institution uh, in terms of carrying out U.S. policy in interventions such as in Iran and Guatemala, etc. Here in Vietnam, while the CIA will be a dominant influence for a number of years, particularly from the mid-50s into the mid-60s, as the intervention, if you will, or war continues, after 1965, the U.S. military comes to play a larger and larger and even a dominant role. So as we evaluate the CIA's role itself in Vietnam, we have to qualify conclusions by saying as much as the CIA may be given credit for or criticized for X, Y, or Z, it was not by, not, by no means the only or even dominant factor by the end of the 1960s and early 1970s in influencing the outcome in Vietnam. A second factor that distinguishes the Vietnam intervention from others is the simple fact that in the cases we have looked at up until now and those that will follow, the CIA is always trying to overthrow a government, <laughs> trying to intervene to destabilize a regime, to oust a particular administration or political group. Here in Vietnam, the CIA will struggle over a number of years uh, to do the opposite, to try to maintain a regime in power. Now, we'll find that even with that difference, many of the factors that we have used in the past to evaluate the success or the failure of the CIA are still relevant even though the specific goal has actually been reversed from ousting a regime to trying to keep one in power. Another thing that we have to take into account here that we did not in past cases is that while this intervention will begin at a time when the Cold War consensus still prevailed in the United States, where the American people and the Congress were pretty well willing to give the executive branch a free hand in how it ran foreign policy because it was assumed the United States was in a war uh, with the forces of communism. Well, that is true when this involvement begins. That consensus begins to break down by the mid-1960s and by the early 1970s has largely collapsed. So Vietnam really rep represents a turning point in that particular factor that we've looked at that influences the outcome of interventions. And indeed, the relationship between the CIA and other branches of government, particularly Congress and the American people, will change dramatically as a result of Vietnam. It really won't be the same again after Vietnam because of the war itself and we will see what happens there. So that is a profound change. And finally, as we're looking at Vietnam, in the other cases, we've broken out separate motivating factors for the United States, whether it was economic factors or it was strategic or ideological influences. And we'll still talk about those today, but I think Vietnam also suggests to us the need to look in a larger context, in other words, to see those separate motivating factors that we've been talking about as part of a larger whole, that to understand what the United States does in this case, we need to begin thinking about some aspects of U.S. foreign policy that I talked about at the beginning of the course. In other words, that the United States sees itself on a mission, uh, is trying to transform the rest of the globe, and Vietnam actually is an important indicator of that process during especially the 1960s as we try to nation build in Vietnam. We see that the U.S. is on this mission to try to radically alter other societies in the world. In the case of Vietnam, that becomes starkly evident because of the conflict itself. And we will see that today that we have to start broadening our perspective as we get to the end of the course in terms of looking at U.S. motivations, that it isn't just enough to say, well, 
it's an economic influence here, it's strategic influence here, it's an ideological influence over there. We really need to come back by the time we get to the end of the course and pull all of these pieces together. Vietnam is a case that is suggestive of that approach, and we'll see that as we go along. Now, first of all, we're going to do, as we've done in each case, look at the historical background and look at Vietnam's evolution. <laughs> Vietnam is a nation with a long and complicated history, but as usual, we're going to boil it down and look particularly at what brings on the crisis in the 20th century that eventually leads to U.S. intervention. If we go to the first slide, uh, Vietnam really emerges out of the workings of the Viets, a people of a distinct ethnic and linguistic background living in the southern reaches of regions influenced by the great Chinese empire. And here we're going back uh, to times before the contemporary era, in other words, even before uh, the birth of Christ. These people came under increasing influence from successive Chinese dynasties as the Chinese began extending their power southward towards what we commonly refer to today as Southeast Asia. And that fact of the Chinese reaching out and seeking to dominate this region at the southern border of their empire constitutes a central reality for Vietnamese history because one of the central truths of Vietnamese history is the effort by the Vietnamese over centuries and indeed over several thousand years to resist foreign domination. The Chinese play the longest and most significant role in that process, but as we will see, of course, the French and the Americans later get involved in precisely the same kind of interaction. One of the things that will point to problems in American foreign policy making when it comes to Vietnam was the failure of American policy makers to understand that reality about Vietnamese history. That indeed the Vietnamese and Chinese had clashed for centuries because of the Chinese effort to dominate Vietnam. Central to the American perspective, as we will see in the 1950s especially, but then the 60s and 70s as well, was the idea that, well, we have two communist powers here. We have the People's Republic of China created uh, as a result of the Chinese Revolution, 1950, and we have this other communist power, North Vietnam, which, as we will see, emerges out of the struggle between the Vietnamese and the French after World War II. So naturally, the Americans assume we have two close allies here because they're both communist powers. And certainly the Chinese did assist the Vietnamese uh, in various stages of their revolutionary struggle. But the larger truth is that the Vietnamese were constantly suspicious and fearful of the Chinese, and they feared the Chinese far more than they feared, for, for example, many Western powers because of this long history. And at the same time, the Chinese are leery of the Vietnamese because they fear in the contemporary era, despite their common communist ideology, that Vietnam wants to dominate Southeast Asia. And one of the realities of China's history has been the effort to prevent a major power emerging at its southern borders. So these were realities of Vietnam's history and its relationship with China down through the centuries. But as we will see, they become lost in the Cold War concerns of the United States as it tries to deal with the problem of Vietnam in the second half of the 20th century. Vietnam's history, indeed, is marked by a series of figures who were known for their resistance to Chinese domination. And indeed, the Vietnamese would fight a series of wars uh, with China over time and would undergo various stages of subordination uh, to China, 
through the centuries, at times virtually becoming part of the Chinese empire, at other times serving as a tributary state. In other words, they paid tribute, but had a relative degree of self-governance. Uh, and then ultimately seeking, of course, their full independence. So this is a long and troubled history between these two societies. And if we go back to the slide again, uh, the first name here, Tru O, was a Vietnamese woman who was known for her armed resistance to the Chinese. And she's described, at least by Westerners, as the Joan of Arc of Vietnam uh, because of her fight against Chinese domination. And there are a series of such people who emerge in Chinese history, uh, Chinese history, in Vietnamese history, as heroes of Vietnamese society and Vietnamese culture because of their resistance to Chinese domination. In the 15th century, a figure emerges from among the members of the nobility in Vietnamese society, a man named, known as Le Loi, uh, who styled himself the Prince of Pacification. And the reason he chooses that title is the fact that he was going to drive the Chinese from Vietnam once again and est establish a dominant dynasty that would rule Vietnam over the next several centuries and largely ward off Chinese domination. So Loy does indeed achieve this goal of pacification in the sense of ridding Vietnam largely of the direct control of China for the next several centuries. And this period of the Lur emperors is known for that independence that Vietnam enjoyed and the continuing resistance to Chinese influence. Although, as we will see, there are a variety of forms of Chinese influence that pervade down through the centuries, even when Vietnam has achieved uh, its independence from China. Now, by the 18th century, this peace, if you will, that had uh, predominated in Vietnam since the 15th century disintegrates when two noble families begin battling each other over control of the empire, the Trinh and the Win. This was to reduce China, uh, China, Vietnam, to a series of battling regions. Uh, the Vietnam became divided at times essentially in two between northern and southern spheres as these two families fought each other over the control of what had been the Lur Empire. By the 19th century, by the early 19th century, the Win clan had turned to outside influences in the hopes of turning the battle in their favor. Specifically, they looked to the French for assistance in their war against the Trin. This was not an entirely unexpected decision because the French had had a presence, albeit minor, in Vietnam for several centuries. We talked early in the course about Western expansionism and explorations from Africa and on to Asia. Well, the French had been very much a part of this, and they had uh, touched at the shores of what we now know as Vietnam. Uh, they had sent missionaries there. Uh, they had carried on trade with Vietnam. And the relationship was a sporadic one. Periodically, uh, the Vietnamese emperor would expel uh, particularly French missionaries when they proved to be particularly annoying. Uh, the major concern being that, of course, French missionaries wanted to convert the local population and take them away from their own religious beliefs, which include ancestor worship, which are central to Vietnamese society. And these missionaries were therefore, when they became particularly uh, vehement in their views, uh, were seen as a threat to stability in Vietnam. So the relationship had been on and off over time. Uh, but there was a familiarity with the French as a foreign power, and it is not surprising that the wind would turn towards the French as a source of foreign assistance in their battle with the Trinh. 
Now, by the 19th century, the French approach to Vietnam, which had been one of interest and periodic trade, uh, was changing. This was the era of expanding European colonialism. This was a period in the early 19th century when the French had recently lost a significant part of their own empire, that is, their empire in North America, Canada. Uh, they had been driven out by the British. And they were seeing the growing power of the British and their own relative weakness, uh, considering the fact that they did not have the kind of far-flung colonial possessions that the British enjoyed. And it had become a common understanding within the French regime that France should once again seek colonial territories. And Vietnam was going to present itself as one such possibility. Now, in addition to military assistance given to the, the win in their battle, uh, the British, uh, the British, the French also began sending missionaries once again into Vietnam. And again, sparks were going to fly as the Win Emperor took exception to the efforts of these missionaries to convert the local population and convert them to a religion which would separate them from much of their own culture and much of the belief system that underpinned the Vietnamese dynasty. So this wasn't just a question of, well, we don't like Christians. It was a question of, well, if you become a Christian, that raises doubts about whether you still will bear loyalty to the Vietnamese emperor. And as a result, as I suggest in the slide here, uh, where it says the emperor likes his missionaries well done, uh, a few French missionaries, some of them were simply sent packing, but those who persisted, uh, those who were anxious, in fact, to enjoy martyrdom, uh, got what they were wishing for. Uh, as they were executed by the Vietnamese emperor, mostly as an object lesson to the French that, look, we've had enough of this stuff. Uh, we see this as a destabilizing influence. If you really want to come and trade, that's fine, but these missionaries, they're intolerable. So he cooked a few of them in oil uh, just to get the message across. The French, meanwhile, were going to take this, of course, as an ideal opportunity to involve themselves more heavily in Vietnam. They had already become involved in the internal politics with their military assistance, but now they had an excuse to go in and launch uh, punitive expeditions against Vietnam. In other words, attack Vietnam on the grounds that they were punishing the emperor for the execution of Christian missionaries. So the beginning of the 19th century, certainly by the 1840s, there are mounting conflicts between Vietnam and the French. The immediate source of the problem would be, of course, the issue of the missionaries. But the larger issue was that the French were looking for ways to expand their territorial empire, and the execution of the missionaries would serve as a justification for punitive expeditions against the Vietnamese. Now, before we go on and see what happens in this relationship between the Vietnamese and the French during the 19th and early 20th century, it's important to be able to characterize what Vietnamese society was like because the French are going to bring substantial changes. Now, as much as the Vietnamese and the Chinese tended to disagree about most things, uh, particularly about the degree of Chinese influence in Vietnam, nevertheless, Vietnam had, in fact, through these long centuries of exposure uh, to Chinese culture and, at times, Chinese domination, developed certain characteristics that were reflective of that Chinese influence. The emperor, for example, was known as the Little Dragon Emperor, whereas the emperor of China was known as the Big Dragon Emperor. So there is a replicating of the dynastic system that exists in China in Vietnam. So, too, in China, the imperial system, if we go back to the slide again, uh, was built on a group of centrally trained bureaucrats, or scholar gentry, as they're 
most commonly termed today, but traditionally known as mandarins. In other words, China had been able to create a large empire by training this large group of bureaucrats who would administer the empire in its far reaches. The Vietnamese had replicated that system. They had their own system of scholar bureaucrats or mandarins. So too, as in China, in Vietnam, merchants were put at a relatively low status in society because peasants are seen as the element which is most important to the maintenance and support of society. Peasants produce food. Peasants are the people who pay tribute or taxes that make the empire possible. Merchants were largely seen as intermediaries who simply skimmed profits off the exchanges between peasants selling food products and people in urban settings who are buying them. So merchants are significant. They're important to the economy, but they're given little political or social status in Vietnam, just as was true in China. Now, at the same time, social relationships in Vietnam were distinct from those in China in one particular regard. In Vietnam, peasants controlled the overwhelming majority of the arable land. Most land that was being worked for agricultural purposes in Vietnam in the first half of the 19th century, and this was true earlier on, was being worked by peasant villages that controlled that land. There was a nobility. We've talked about families that were part of the nobility. But they, for the most part, are not large landowners. What they are are tribute collectors. Their principal source of income is to collect tribute for the emperor. They then take their cut and pass the rest on to the empire. But they do not function primarily as large landowners producing their own crops. They are tax collectors, primarily. Not exclusively, but primarily. This is different from China, where, in fact, the nobility was expanding its land holdings over a series of centuries and creating increasing incursions upon peasant land. What it also means is that peasant villages in Vietnam and peasants had considerable independence in conducting their own affairs. Now, that is not to say that this was a democracy by any stretch of the imagination. Most societies weren't in the early 19th century. Uh, it is an empire. The emperor is considered to have absolute power. But the truth is that most of daily life and most of the decisions about what is going to be done in terms of daily life, other than you know, the payment of tribute and, of course, having to serve perhaps in the militias or the imperial army at a given time, but most of the other day-to-day -day decisions governing the village are made by villages and by a council of elders within the village. So there is a considerable amount of independence uh, for villagers and for peasants in terms of how they run their daily lives. They have a considerable material base for themselves because they control the land that they work. Now, going back to the slide, one other important aspect of village life and of peasant life and Vietnamese life in general is ancestor worship. Again, this is a common characteristic that they share with the Chinese. The idea that one owes filial loyalty, not only to one's parents, but to those generations that have gone before. The idea of the extended family, the clan, is extremely important. And it extends not only to the living members of that clan, but to previous generations who are honored and worshipped. And worship of ancestors is a vitally important part of the religious and cultural functions of Vietnamese society, especially at the peasant level. And those connections are rooted not only in the extended family, but in the village itself, because the village tends to be the home place of that clan or a portion of that clan, that extended family. 
So there is a tight-knit connection between peasants, their village, the land that it controls, their extended family, and their religious beliefs in terms of ancestor worship. Furthermore, it's believed that each village has protective spirits that guide it and protect the people within it. So there are a series of interwoven characteristics of peasant society that are focused on the village and are sustained by the fact that the village controls its own land. To be without land in this society would be to be excluded from the core life of the village and to be excluded from the core life of the clan. You're largely becoming a social outcast if you lose land. So these are important characteristics of Vietnamese society to remember as we see changes come about as the encounter with the French intensifies during the 19th century. Now, what happens in the course of the 19th century, roughly from the 1840s into the 1880s, is that the French use the actions against the missionaries to justify a series of military expeditions. Initially, punitive expeditions that simply inflict punishment, but gradually a situation in which the French take increasing control over portions of Vietnam. They establish their own rule in Vietnam, particularly in the south and then moving northward. By the 1880s, Vietnam still has its own emperor, but succeeding emperors are no more than puppet emperors. In other words, they are there simply as a symbol, a cover for the fact that the French now control Vietnam as a colony, and the emperor takes his orders from the French. So Vietnam, by the 1880s, has effectively lost its independence, and the imperial system has become a cover for French imperial rule. Now, if we go back to the slide again, we will see that in the 1890s, with the French in virtual total control, the mandarins, the bureaucrats, staged a rebellion against French control. But they are quickly defeated. The lesson of this rebellion for the Vietnamese, at least for many of them, was that if they were ever going to get rid of the French, they were going to have to try to build some kind of popular base of support if that was to be achieved. A few thousand bureaucrats trying to rally support was not going to do it. The French had superior technology in terms of military technologies. It was going to be impossible to get rid of them if this rebellion was simply sparked by members of the elite. Now, the French in taking over Vietnam, are anxious to see to it that the colony will pay for itself. One of the ongoing disputes in imperial systems was always the fact that colonies cost too much. And as a result, the French quickly set about turning Vietnam into an export economy. Now, the Vietnamese had long produced rice for centuries and centuries. And they had exported a small portion of it each year, but most rice was for internal consumption. Now, what the French want to do is turn rice production into a major export industry. To do that, they are going to create a new class of landowners. Remember, up until now, most members of the nobility were not primarily landowners. They might have some land. They almost never really had some land. But their main purpose was to gather taxes. Now, the French want to create an indigenous large landowning class. They draw up laws that will allow that to happen. And very soon, former members of the nobility, merchants, are engaging in the purchase of land and setting up large commercial estates to grow and export rice. So the French undertake a radical transformation of Vietnamese society in order for it to generate 
considerable export wealth. And that means the creation of a new landowning class. What it also is going to mean, of course, is a considerable loss of land by Vietnamese peasants. And if you follow the course of what happens in Vietnam roughly from the 1880s through the 1930s, uh, after that's a lot to track because of the Second World War, but during that whole period, over more than 50 years, you see a steady loss of land by peasants, whereas peasants once controlled the overwhelming majority of the land, uh, the arable land in Vietnam, uh, they control less than 50% down to a third by the time you get into the 1930s. And this land is being lost, of course, to the large landowners, and many peasants are becoming little more than wage workers. They may still live in a village, but the land is not their own. Hmm. This is a dramatic transformation that the French bring about. Another aspect of this, although this part is controlled more by the French themselves, was also the development of the rubber industry. Uh, the creation of some 1,200 to 1,400 large rubber plantations in Vietnam to tap rubber trees and export the product into the world market. Most of these were owned by French colonists, but they were worked by Vietnamese laborers who, you, as you can imagine, worked under less than ideal conditions, conditions somewhat reminiscent of what Congolese endured under the Belgians. At the same time, however, the French government remained dissatisfied with the results of these economic changes. They felt that France was still bearing too large a cost for the maintenance of the colony. And as a result, it, the government sent this man, Paul Dumer, to Vietnam as a colonial governor in the 1890s. And Dumer was going to come up with a series of strategies to make the colony more profitable, to make it pay its own expenses. For example, setting up a series of monopolies on products uh, that would be controlled by the government, especially salt. And this became one of the most hated government institutions in Vietnam because the Vietnamese found themselves constantly struggling to acquire enough salt because the monopoly, of course, wanted to create conditions of scarcity that helped drive prices up. And salt was absolutely essential to life in Vietnam as it was through much of the world because you needed to preserve food. Now, there is no refrigeration. Uh, how do you preserve food? You salt it. And if you can't salt it, you can't preserve it. And therefore, you're going to go hungry, starve to death. So this became one of the most hated uh, aspects of French colonial rule. There were also various labor taxes that were imposed, gang labor that was required for the building of roads and railroads, etc. And this weighed on the local population as well, that the burden of essentially building the colony was placed on the colonial population. Out of these changes that the French carry out in the second half of the 19th and beginning of the 20th century is created a highly volatile social mix. First of all, in general, there is the fact that Vietnam has this history of resisting external domination. And yet here, once again, the Vietnamese face external domination this time in the form of the French rather than the Chinese. So that immediately is going to be a cause for conflict because this violates this long struggle by the Vietnamese to be free and independent. Secondly, the French in promoting export agriculture have deprived a growing portion of the peasant population of land. And this, of course, means that they are also undermining the stability and the social constructs of the peasant village. Because what is the village if it doesn't control its own land? Where is the independence of the village that once existed? Because they did control their own land. And other than paying taxes to the nobility, they were pretty much free to run their own affairs. Now, they don't control that land. And if they've lost land, many of them will lose the opportunity to be full participants in their own clans. So this is, aside from the economic effects, that you have to work for somebody else now, there are the social and cultural impacts of this loss of independence among so many villages. It should be noted that this is particularly true in the South, 
more than in the north. It happens in both halves of Vietnam. But roughly speaking, if we divide Vietnam in half, the southern portion suffers more in the way of loss of land by peasants. The reason was fairly simple. The northern half of Vietnam is relatively mountainous. And although there are, of course, large numbers of peasants working land and valleys and on mountainsides, the topography doesn't lend itself readily to the establishment of large commercial estates. Whereas in the south, you have a vast stretch of flat lands, especially in the southernmost portions of Vietnam, that readily lend themselves to the creation of large commercial estates. So the impetus to create these estates and to drive peasants off of their land is far more intense in the south than the north, although it happens in both locations. A second factor, or a third factor, I should say, in creating this volatile society is the fate of the middle class in Vietnam. Now, actually, the French contribute to the expansion of a middle class in Vietnam, partly because of the creation of an export economy, partly because of the creation of an elaborate colonial bureaucracy. And as with other colonial powers, they're going to man that bureaucracy in part. The lower levels, the lower echelon jobs, will be given to Vietnamese because it's cheaper to do it that way. Indeed, the French contribute further to the creation of a Vietnamese middle class because they offer education to a small percentage of the population that can run all the way from primary school through university. In fact, a number of Vietnamese got their university degrees at the Sorbonne, the leading university in France. But as they create this middle class of university-educated people, many of them with professional degrees as doctors and lawyers, etc., this growing group of middle class people discover that there are few economic opportunities for them. Yes, there are some jobs in the government, but they're not going to get the best jobs. You may be a doctor, but you're not going to be allowed to treat French patients. You may be a lawyer, but you're not going to be allowed to practice in French courts. There are a growing number of people with university education who can find no reasonable outlet for their education and their skills within this society that is so utterly dominated by the French. So you've got growing resentment on the part of the middle class that, yes, we have an education, but where does it leave us? We're second-class citizens within our own society. A growing number of these people will seek an outlet by going to France and after they receive their education, staying in France or going back to France when they discover there are a few opportunities in Vietnam itself. In fact, if we go back to the slide here, you'll see that uh, there is a growing exile community in France, particularly in Paris, of Vietnamese, uh, many of them well-educated, the children of successful merchants, etc., but who themselves are unable to find decent employment within their own society. Now, by the early 20th century, the Vietnamese were beginning to organize political movements. They weren't necessarily political parties in all cases, but political movements that gave vent to their growing frustration with their condition as colonial subjects of France. The first group mentioned here, the Constitutionalist Party, consisted largely of the new landowning class, of Vietnamese who had become large landowners uh, in the, sometime in the past several generations since the French had begun this process. Now, needless to say, they are not the sworn enemies of the French. They only came into existence. Their economic opportunities were created by the French. So it's not as if they created the Constitutionalist Party to take up arms against the French. What they are suggesting, rather, is that Vietnamese should have a larger role in the running of Vietnamese society. So their approach is fairly tame. They're not demanding the ouster of the French, but rather a greater role for the Vietnamese in running their society. But they are not demanding independence. Now, if we go back to the slide again, there is a second group 
the nationalists, if we can see that on the slide. Uh, can we see it on the slide? <laughs> Maybe. Um, we can go to the slide. <laughs> That'll be good. Um, the nationalists are the second group, and they consist pretty much of bureaucrats, people who are junior military officers in the colonial army, uh, people who are clerks and hold somewhat higher positions in the colonial bureaucracy. And in addition to that, uh, doctors, lawyers, members of the professional classes. So the nationalist group or movement, or as it's known, are largely middle class. They do want independence. But their approach is essentially to attempt a military coup. What they're hoping is that because some of them are members of the colonial military, that they can use those junior military officers to help them stage a coup and oust the French. But they are not looking to build a mass-based political party. And indeed, they will attempt a coup at the end of the 1920s uh, to try to oust the French, and it will quickly fizzle. And their greatest weakness was precisely the fact that they didn't see themselves as a movement that needed to go out and build mass support. And they were going to face the same problem that the Mandarins had faced in the 1890s, which is if you don't have a mass base of support, how are you going to get rid of the French when they hold overwhelming military superiority? So the nationalists do want independence, but at least up until this time, until the end of the 1920s, they were unwilling to try to build a popular base for their movement. Now, the third and final group are the communists. The communist party that is created in the 1920s does want immediate independence, does want to get rid of the French, and does want to build a mass base among workers and peasants. And, of course, they have a larger vision in the end that not only will they oust the French, but they'll create a socialist society eventually uh, within Vietnam. But they are the one party that, as of the end of the 1920s, is really trying to build a mass base of support in order to get rid of the French. Now, if we go to the next slide, we'll see that an opportunity arises for the communists in 1929. The late 1920s were a period when, for much of the world, the Great Depression had already begun. When Americans think of the Depression and time that event, they say, well, it started in October of 1929 with the stock market crash. But in many countries, the Depression started earlier, in the late 1920s, 1926, 27, 28, depending on which country we're talking about. And the reason that was happening was because the prices for the export products of these economies were falling steadily. What had happened around the world is that many economies were priming themselves up with improved technologies and transportation to export primary products, agricultural products like rice, mineral products, etc., and flooding the world market with these goods, which was driving the price down for these products. And that's exactly what was happening in Vietnam. Vietnam had come to rely heavily on the export of rice, but rice was flooding the world market. So the price of rice was falling, and the Vietnamese economy was suffering severely. And there was extensive suffering in the Vietnamese countryside as people found that as wage earners, and that's what they now are, many of them, because they're not working their own plots of land, they're working on commercial estates, that what they can earn may not even be sufficient to feed them that they are living on less than subsistence wages and you don't live on below subsistence wages for very long because that's what subsistence means. In their desperation, many peasants in Vietnam took up arms and began attacking uh, government officials. They began attacking merchants who they blamed for hoarding goods uh, and for deliberately uh, manipulating the price of rice, etc. So a rebellion begins among peasants in Vietnam in 1929. Now, 
the interesting thing is the communists hadn't planned this. This was not their idea. They were looking down the road. Not that they didn't plan a, an armed uprising at some point, but they knew they weren't ready. <laughs> they were nowhere near ready. They'd only been preparing for about four or five years, you know, getting organized, spreading their ideas. And suddenly the peasants are taking matters into their own hands and rising up against the French and against the large landowners. The problem for the communists now was what to do. <laughs> if they turned a deaf ear to what the peasants were doing, then how could they possibly present themselves again as the leaders of popular revolution when they ignored the popular revolution right in their own backyard? On the other hand, if they put themselves at the forefront of this rebellion, they know they're going to get killed because <laughs> they know that there's no way that they can match the military capabilities of the French. Uh, deciding that they have to maintain their position as leaders of revolution, they put themselves at the head of the peasant uprising and indeed find themselves being shot down. And thousands of uh, communists and peasants, of course, uh, will be killed during the uprising and thousands more will be thrown into prison. So this peasant rebellion that begins in 1929 is soon crushed by the French and along with it uh, much of the emerging communist party and the Communist Party, not surprisingly, is now outlawed in Vietnam. Out of this fiasco, however, uh, the Communists will actually be able to build a much stronger institution than they had previously. And if we go back to the slide, we'll see that it revolves around two men in particular. Uh, one who took the uh, sort of pseudonym, the war name, uh, of Ho Chi Minh and a fellow communist who would head the military wing of the party uh, who was known as General Jia. These two men, in particular Ho Chi Minh, become the focal point of the communist struggle in the Vietnamese Revolution after 1929. Now, Ho Chi Minh is a fascinating character in his own right. His father was a uh, provincial official who worked for the French government. At some point, he had some type of religious vision and decided to uh, go off and become a preacher, uh, leaving his family, including multiple children, um, to sort of fend for themselves. Ho may have inherited a certain element of his father's wanderlust because in 1912, when he was in his early 20s, he signed on to a tramp steamer uh, and sailed from Vietnam and spent the next several years um, really wandering the world. Uh, for a time, in fact, he lived in Brooklyn, New York. Uh, he was working as uh, a cook in a restaurant. And in fact, that's what he did pretty much when he was serving on ships. He eventually winds up in Europe in Paris, not surprisingly, given French influence and education, etc. And there in Paris becomes part of uh, the exile community and particularly uh, the nationalist uh, community among the exiles. And by that I don't mean that they belong to the Nationalist Party, but people who are pressing for independence for Vietnam. And he begins writing for some local journals. Uh, he becomes affiliated with uh, members of the socialist movement among the exile community uh, and makes a name for himself as a result of his newspaper articles and his reputation essentially as a revolutionary intellectual. Now, when the First World War comes to an end, of course, the peace conference that will decide the future of Europe and much of the world uh, is held in Versailles, uh, a suburb of Paris. And Ho Chi Minh is drawn to that conference. He's drawn to it by the presence of Woodrow Wilson, the American president. Woodrow Wilson has issued his famous 14 points. He's called for, among other things, self-determination for people. Now, what Woodrow Wilson has in mind by self-determination, he means 
well, we have this mess in Europe with all these different ethnic and linguistic groups and the, uh, the various empires that have collapsed, like the Austro-Hungarian Empire and the German Empire, etc. So we need to sort this out, and to sort it out, we need to have people achieve self-determination. They will decide uh, the shapes of their new societies and states. Uh, what Ho Chi Minh has in mind, however, is the idea that, well, gee, if self-determination is good for the Europeans, it should be good for the Vietnamese, right? And he's going to try to appeal to Woodrow Wilson to affirm that policy and that doctrine for Vietnam and for other people in the colonial world. Now, he'll never get to see Wilson, <laughs> not surprisingly. Uh, but Ho Chi Minh was not just a sort of idealistic dreamer. He had a logic in mind when he tries to get into an interview with Woodrow Wilson. Uh, as he looks at the world, he realizes that there are only a few true superpowers, like England and France and Germany uh, and the United States. And of those, only the United States doesn't have large territorial possessions, large colonial possessions. So if there is one large, powerful nation that might help Vietnam because it doesn't have a vested interest in colonialism, it's the United States. So there is a logic there uh, when Ho Chi Minh tries to approach Woodrow Wilson. And we will see that he maintains that approach uh, for several decades into the future that if there is a logical ally for the Vietnamese in the world, it's the United States. And ironically, of course, the United States that will wind up in a war with Ho Chi Minh um, by the 1960s. But at this time, you know, his thinking made pretty good sense as to where he might be able to appeal uh, to a superpower that it could assist him and give him some leverage in dealing with France as a great colonial power. If we go back to the slide here, uh, we'll see that after this failure, Ho Chi Minh decides to travel to the new center for revolutionary thinking in the world, which is Moscow, because, of course, the Russian Revolution occurred in 1917. We're now in 1919. So here is the hub of revolutionary activity in the world. It's in the new Soviet Union. And he will go there. And during his time in the Soviet Union, uh, in the early 1920s, he will become a member of the Communist Party. And he will remain, of course, a devoted member of the Communist Party in the decades ahead. He will, from there, return to Vietnam, although he will spend most of his time uh, living in southern China uh, on the border of Vietnam. Because, of course, it was kind of dangerous for him to go in, into Vietnam since anybody who was a communist was considered a threat and the Communist Party was outlawed. In fact, uh, the French were well aware of Ho Chi Minh and wanted to get rid of him. Uh, they had alerted other intelligence groups and security groups around the world, including the British, uh, to be on the lookout for Ho Chi Minh. Uh, they wanted him arrested. And in fact, uh, at one point while visiting Hong Kong, he was arrested by British authorities and put into prison. And they were, of course, planning on deporting him and sending him to Vietnam, where he was probably going to spend a very long time in jail uh, if he wasn't executed. However, while he was in the jail, in the prison in Hong Kong, uh, he sort of pulls a Count of Monte Cristo. Uh, he manages to get himself inserted into a bag that is used for getting rid of cadavers, and his bag is thrown over the side of the prison wall into Hong Kong Harbor, where he slits it open, swims away, and for the next few years, the French and the British actually reported him as being dead, as having died in prison. Uh, but he eventually returns to southern China and continues the organizing of the Vietnamese Communist Party, looking forward to the day when he will lead the communists in a revolution against French control. However, events are going to intervene once again in Ho's life, specifically World War II. And in 1940, the Japanese occupation of Vietnam. The Japanese are displacing the French, of course, and taking control. Although, in fact, as most imperial powers do, uh, 
the Japanese left most of the French bureaucrats in place to run the system for them. And when you occupy a colonial possession, you don't want to have to expend all your personnel trying to run the system. Instead, you just tell the French, well, now we're in charge. You know, instead of reporting to the French prime minister or president or whatever, now you're reporting to us. And most of the French bureaucrats go on working for the Japanese. Hmm. Ho Chi Minh, as a good nationalist, and besides being a communist, organizes the communist movement into resistance groups against the Japanese. Now, the nationalists were doing the same thing. They, too, the nationalist group that had rebelled uh, back at the end of the 1920s, in 1930, uh, they are also organizing resistance, but they are far less prepared to do that than are the communists, for a simple reason. The communists had been outlawed ever since the uprising in 1929. And therefore, they had had to work essentially as a covert, clandestine institution for more than a decade. They had broken themselves up into small cells so that in a five-man cell, only one member knew a member of another cell, limiting the possibility that the government could come in and round up large numbers of people because, well, once we get one, we'll just follow that trail to all the other people. They had operated as a clandestine institution for more than a decade. So they were already operating underground when the Japanese show up, whereas the nationalists who are operating openly uh, within the French colonial system are devastated. Many of their leaders are arrested and executed. Uh, they lose a large part of their organization when the Japanese arrive, because the Japanese, of course, don't want anything to do with you know, these nationalists. But the communists, they're already in hiding. They've already been essentially involved in resistance for more than a decade. So they are better prepared uh, to form the core of the resistance against the Japanese. And if we go back to the slide again, we'll see that that resistance also brings Ho Chi Minh and the communists into contact with the OSS, the Office of Strategic Services, the predecessor of the CIA. There are several factors involved here. One the communists were helping to rescue American pilots who were shot down over southern China during the war. So they were providing a service to the Americans. And of course, the Americans, in the form of the OSS, were anxious to offer assistance to resistance groups, whether they were in France or Burma or, in this case, Vietnam, who are fighting against the Axis powers, and the communists are doing that. So the OSS actually airdrops personnel into Vietnam to link up with the communists and provide small arms and also some training uh, to the communist resistance forces, with the idea, of course, that anything that's hostile to the Japanese is good for us. And the OSS and the communists actually develop some close ties. Indeed, when the war ends, senior officers in the OSS were recommending uh, in Washington that Vietnam be turned over to Ho Chi Minh, that he was clearly a popular nationalist, and whatever his po particular political views on communism, he was more of a nationalist than he was a communist, which is a fairly actually accurate description of Ho Chi Minh, actually. But in any case, that was their idea that since Vietnam's future was uncertain at that point, they thought the best thing to do was to have Ho Chi Minh run the country. Uh, needless to say, as we will see, their views were not the ones that were accepted uh, in Washington at this time. But with the collapse of the Japanese Empire and the evacuation of Japanese troops from Vietnam, an opportunity is created for Ho Chi Minh and the Communists. In August of 1945, Ho Chi Minh will go to the town hall in Hanoi, which is the capital in Vietnam, and issue a Declaration of Independence for Vietnam. In it, this declaration includes direct quotes from Thomas Jefferson's Declaration of Independence. And again, this is not accidental. Ho Chi Minh is trying to reach out to the Americans and say, look, we have some of the same ideas. I know I'm a communist, and you're not, 
but we want the same kinds of things. Self-determination for our people, independence for our nation. That's what we want. So this is a deliberate effort by Ho Chi Minh to try to provide some common ground between himself and the Americans, because he still sees the Americans as the principal possibility for fending off French colonial rule. Any other option he considers unlikely or even hostile. For example, in the post-war confusion, there is a great deal of discussion about what's going to happen in Vietnam. And uh, indeed, for a time, some Chinese nationalist troops, in other words, they were the ones fighting the communists in China, are sent into Vietnam. And there is some proposal that they should, for a time, take over governance of Vietnam. And Ho Chi Minh says, well, no, you know, uh, I'd rather deal with the French wolf, and I'm putting it politely here, than eat Chinese dung forever. Uh, and what he was saying is, look, we know the Chinese, you know, we have a history. <laughs> and as bad as the French are, they've only been here for a little over half a century, the Chinese have been dealing with for hundreds and hundreds of years. So forget it. In those circumstances, again, the Americans look awfully appealing. That's why he's trying to establish some kind of common ground with them. However, the Declaration of Independence will not have a long-term effect. The French are insisting that they're going to return to Vietnam. The United States needs to make a decision, since it is clearly the dominant power in the world at the end of the war, as to what it is going to do in these circumstances. Will it oppose the French return? The State Department is largely composed of people who are focused on the fate of Europe. They're concerned about the Soviet Union and the fact that the Soviet Union might try to take over Western Europe. We talked about this in about the early days of the CIA and the emerging Cold War. Uh, and therefore, the conclusion in Washington is, look, at, if the French need Vietnam back to help maintain stability and you know, grow their economy again, we really can't interfere because our real concern is stabilizing Europe. And if reoccupying Vietnam will help, well, then so be it. The Vietnamese will just have to deal with it. So the Americans are not going to interfere with the French. And in the face of overwhelming French power, Ho Chi Minh agrees that they will be allowed to re-enter Vietnam with the idea that they were going to help prepare Vietnam uh, for independence in the future, when nobody says. Ho Chi Minh knows it's a lot of baloney, but he also knows that if he tries to stand and fight and hold on to the capital, etc., his people will just be eaten alive by the French military. But soon after the French return, war breaks out between the communists and the French. And indeed, if we go back to the slide here, we'll see that war drags on from 1946 to 1954. And this is a guerrilla insurgency. This is where General Jap develops his tactics of hit-and-run attacks on the French, setting up ambushes, ambushing them as they move through the jungles, ambushing them as they move to small outposts that they hold in the countryside. Many villages are controlled by the communists at night and by the French during the day, because the French are secure in their military movements only when they can move during daylight hours. Increasingly, this conflict is one that ties the French down in this vicious guerrilla war. Now, again, the communists are not the only ones fighting the French. The nationalists are fighting them as well. And specifically, this man uh, listed on the slide, No Dinh Diem, uh, has emerged as the dominant leader of the nationalists. And the nationalists and the communists spend most of their time fighting the French, but also spend a fair amount of time fighting each other. Indeed, at one point, the communists captured Diem, and he's taken to see Ho Chi Minh. And Ho Chi Minh tries to convince Diem to join his movement, to join the communists, and merge the nationalist movement with the communist movement. Diem refuses. And Ho Chi Minh actually lets him go, despite the advice of his 
compatriots who say, well, we, we should kill this guy now and get it over with because we're going to have to do it sooner or later. Uh, he lets him go, and Ho Chi Minh later admits that yeah, it was a decision he regrets because, of course, Diem will come back to haunt him in the future. But at this point, the communists still have the dominant hand in terms of resistance to the French. They are the ones who people most closely identify with the resistance. And in fact, Diem, after this close call with the communists, will leave Vietnam. And he will not return until the war between the communists and the French is over. And that will considerably undermine his standing as a national leader, whereas Ho Chi Minh, of course, can point to the fact that he was in Vietnam throughout these years, from 46 to 54, fighting off the French. Now, if we go to the next slide, you'll see that it, in France, the mounting guerrilla insurgency in Vietnam is taking a growing toll on France itself. Indeed, it is French leaders, not Americans, as we often believe, who first applied this famous phrase to Vietnam that we can see the light at the end of the tunnel. In other words, we're winning the struggle even though it doesn't look like it. The French try a variety of strategies to win this war and finally settle on a strategy known as the anchor in the countryside. They realize that the communists have come to dominate the Vietnamese countryside in this struggle. And they control, they, the French, control the urban areas. But they want to have a powerful base in the countryside where they can strike out at the communists. So they choose a market town in north central Vietnam called Dien Bien Phu, from which they believe they can strike out at the communists in the countryside and eventually defeat them. Dien Bien Phu is in a mountain valley, but the French are sure that the mountains are so high that the communists could never install artillery to attack them. And besides which, even if they ran into trouble, they're confident that they can use their air power to strike back at the communists. So this could be a secure base from which they hope to achieve victory. However, beginning in March of 1954, the communists lay siege to Dien Bien Phu. They demonstrate that those mountains aren't that high. That with some mules, and by breaking down your artillery pieces, uh, you can scale the mountains and establish artillery bases in the mountains and shell Dien Bien Phu. And furthermore, the weather is increasingly bad at this time of year, clouds and rain, so it becomes almost impossible to run bombing missions. Hmm. So the French find themselves under siege in Dien Bien Phu from the months of March until May 1954. And finally in May, they agree that they will withdraw from Dien Bien Phu, and in effect, they are conceding that they are about to abandon this whole war. Hmm. Now, to resolve the future of Vietnam, a conference is held in Geneva, Switzerland. It is to be a multilateral conference, including the major Western powers, the Soviet Union, the People's Republic of China, the communist Chinese government, and, of course, representatives of the Vietnamese communists. Now, John Foster Dulles, the U.S. Secretary of State, has a simple approach to the Geneva Conference, and that is no compromise, no surrender, no matter what the French have said after Dien Bien Phu. He doesn't care. He doesn't want the French or the West to surrender a single thing to the communists. Walter Bedell Smith, who you may remember was, became one of the directors of Central Intelligence, was sent as the U.S. representative to the Geneva Conference and spent most of his time in a little chalet uh, because he didn't go to most of the meetings because there was nothing for him to say because the position was, we won't compromise on anything. The communists, the Viet Minh as they're now, their military wing, uh, the communist answer is, look at, you can't win back at the negotiating table which you already lost in the battlefield. We already won, okay? It's our country. Give it back to us. Total. 
So a deadlock develops. We have the Americans on one extreme saying, we won't compromise anything. And then the communists on the other side saying, look, we won. Give us our country. So a compromise needs to be reached. And stepping in to help secure the compromise is the foreign minister of the People's Republic of China, the Viet Minh's communist ally, the Chinese communists. Cho and Lai suggest, well, let's split the difference between you guys by splitting the country in half. We'll draw a line, which eventually is determined to be the 17th parallel, which essentially slices Vietnam in half, north and south. And the communists will get the north, and then we'll establish a non-communist government in the south. Now, the understanding is that this is to be temporary, and that a permanent resolution will be achieved in terms of Vietnam's future, this will be temporary. It's a way of getting something done at the conference. In fact, the agreement is to be that a national election encompassing North and South will be held in two years' time, 1956, and that will determine the long-term fate of Vietnam. Ho Chi Minh's reaction to this proposal by the Chinese was to say, the Chinese are ready to fight to the last Vietnamese, meaning the Chinese are selling us out. And he was not entirely wrong. The Chinese had no desire to see a unified Vietnam. Splitting it in half was a good way of at least delaying that possibility, delaying the emergence of a dominant nation in Southeast Asia. So once again, this old rivalry between the Chinese and the Vietnamese is very apparent. You know, ideology is one thing, history is another. And the Chinese were following their history. We don't want a dominant power down in that southern region. We don't want Vietnam unified. It's okay with us if there's a long-term delay in the process. In the end, the communists don't have much choice because even the Soviets wanting a solution, their greater concern is Europe, not what's going on in Southeast Asia. With both the Soviets and the Chinese on board, there's really no one for them to turn to to try to get total independence for Vietnam under communist rule. And so the country will be divided with the understanding, at least, that an election is to be held in two years' time to determine its fate. This marks the end of the first Vietnamese revolution. And in it, this affected peasants who had lost land under the French, a middle class that had gained education but lacked economic opportunity, had joined under the leadership of the communists to seek national liberation. It was an anti-colonial struggle triggered in no small measure by both French colonialism, but also by the radical changes that the French had brought in Vietnamese society. But it's also an unfinished revolution because the fate of Vietnam is still undecided because Vietnam is divided in two. So the revolution will now enter a second phase as the French withdraw and the Americans take their place much of the dyna dynamics of the first revolution will remain in place of disaffected peasants and a disaffected middle class. And that will play a central role in what will happen to the two Vietnams after 1954, as the Americans and specifically the Central Intelligence Agency come to play a central role in these events. But to understand the dynamics of these events after 1954, it's essential to understand what we have just looked at in terms of the forces that brought about this revolution and threw off French domination. Now we will see what happens to those same forces as they encounter the Americans and the Americans attempt to build a pro-Western government in South Vietnam. We'll come back to that in a few minutes.